Hello everyone, welcome back on Hanji Talks Japanese Art. Today I'm back with a new video. The video of today is inspired by a dear friend of mine, she's called Avery, and first I would like to thank her for getting me interested in this topic, so thanks. So now I'll tell you what this video is about, what is this mysterious topic. It's about guns used by the samurai in the late 16th century onwards in Japan. So, if you are interested in this video, I will let you know that first I will talk about the introduction of guns in Japan and secondly I will look at a Japanese gun from <laughs> the late 16th century uh, which is now part of the collection of the Met Museum in New York and I will look at how this gun blends a tradition of craftsmanship from Portugal and Japan, so how it blends these two different cultures in its materiality. So if this sounds interesting to you, make sure to stick around and let's jump right in. So when we talk about the Japanese warrior, when we talk about samurai, usually there is one weapon that comes to mind, I think, for everybody. And that is, of course, the sword. The katana has come as become in our imagination the symbol of the Japanese warrior. But to tell the truth, the samurai, they fought with an array of weapons. Not only swords, and mostly not swords, but also bows and arrows, and pole weapons, and ultimately guns. So how did guns arrive in Japan? They weren't invented there but they were actually acquired from a different culture. And we can pinpoint exactly the moment in time and space when guns arrived in Japan. And it's a really fascinating story. So, guns arrived in 1543 on the island of Tanegashima. They arrived through a boat. This boat arrived from... This boat was a Chinese boat it's called technically a junk, and he hosted quite a big crew. And amongst these people, there were two men from Portugal. The boat happened to be stranded on the island of Tanegashima due to a storm. This island in the, is, I will put a little map here, it's in the southeast of the island of Kyushu. So when this boat was stranded and there were two Portuguese men on it, it, was, it created a great interest within the local population because these people were white, <laughs> first of all, and Japan at the time had not much contact or no contacts with Europe. So there were many things which interested the local population about these Portuguese men, where did they come from, and the way in which they ate, and the way in which they drank, and the way in which they behaved. And so they decided to take them to the local lord, who was called Lord Tokitaka, uh, to present them to him. And as soon as they arrived, all these little details about them caught the interest of the lord and of all the people present. And amongst other of these details, one was very important, that the Portuguese were carrying these oblong objects with themselves at all times. And they asked the Portuguese men about it, and the Portuguese immediately gave an answer and organized a demonstration. Now you can imagine, you have probably already guessed, that these oblong objects, they were matchlock guns or muskets, and the demonstration was actually shooting a target and blowing it a hundred feet away. So with a loud bang, the muskets were fired, and after that there was no need for more wars. Immediately the warrior lords who were present, they understood the power of guns and immediately became really interested in them. So with this new introduction of this weapon, the Japanese immediately started wanting 
to be in the sun as well. And the, the gun was actually named, they became known as Tanegashima or Tanegashima Teppo. Now, Teppo was a word that was already in use to indicate some kind of explosive weapons that had already been introduced by the Mongols, but which quite differed in use from the muskets. And Tanegashima was simply the name of the island in which the muskets had arrived. And because we're talking already also about naming things, let's also say that the European people, they were also named in this process uh, due to the Portuguese. So because the Portuguese had arrived from the south, uh, we became known as Namban Sen, the southern barbarians. So to give you an idea of how widespread, how interested the Japanese were in the Mecho gun, let's say that the gun was introduced in 1543. By the 1550s, it had already been adopted as auxiliary weapon in the Japanese various local armies. And by the late 1570s, it had become the main weapon of the Japanese warriors. So we have to keep in mind that to produce such weapons, it was a great scale effort. So not only they had to find the materials to make the metal guns, they also had to find materials to make the gunpowder. And then these had to be transported and the guns and the powder they had to be made. So this was a big, a big investment, <laughs> a big effort. And it shows how much the Japanese were willing to do to make these weapons. We can mention that at first, especially around the late 1550s and 60s, the, the weapons they were also bought or borrowed from the Portuguese. They weren't immediately make, made. It took a, a progress of at least a few months or years to make these crafts perfect, to make good guns in big quantity. So the first main Japanese warrior lord to understand the power of the gun was Oda Nobunaga. Now I mentioned him before, Oda Nobunaga was, is considered the first of the three unifiers of Japan. He implemented the use of the gun in his army and actually in 1575 he managed to defeat the Takeda, Ka Takeda clan <laughs> thanks to his strategic use of matchlock guns. And uh, Oda Nobunaga didn't finish his <laughs> plan to unify the Japanese territory. Actually, his plan was taken on and continued by another warrior called Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Now, keep this guy's name in your mind because we're gonna talk about him in a few minutes. So now, Let's look at one of these metro guns and I chose a very interesting one for this video. So the one that we're gonna talk about is a Japanese metro gun from the late 16th, early 17th century. And it's now part of the collection of the Met Museum in New York. But originally it belonged to a Japanese warrior lord called Horio Yoshiharu. Something very fascinating is that we know exactly how this gun got into the collection of the Met Museum in New York. And we know this because the, at the time, curator uh, wrote his adventure in a catalog in which he, talk, he talks about acquiring this gun. This curator was Bashford Dean and he published a book, a catalog, in 1916 called the Notes on Arms and Armor. And in this catalog, he tells the story about traveling to Japan in 1905 and traveling to the city of Matsue. There he wanted to visit a temple to take some notes and take some pictures, photo early photographs of a very specific samurai armor. And while he was there, he was asked if he would like to see some additional objects which were for sale and of course he agreed and amongst his object was our gun and he immediately 
saw it and considered it unique, like no gun he had ever seen before in Japan, and decided to buy it and brought it back with him to New York. So the way in which Bash Waldin described this, this weapon was as a unique exemplar in its time. And the way I like to look at it is to see it as a blend of European and Japanese craftsmanship. So let's look at it and why consider it this way. So, like other muskets, this gun is also made of basically wood and steel. But what makes this gun incredibly unique is its decoration. So, Bashwardin and the narrators at the Met, they had the possibility to handle the gun. And what Bashwardin realized is that the decoration is not engraved on the metal of the gun, but rather it is applied. And also you could see the technique in which the stock had been attached to the barrel, or the barrel had been attached to the stock, I don't know exactly how it works, but he could see that this technique used was typically European, not really Japanese. So this led to an hypothesis, and the hypothesis is that the, actually the barrel of the gun may have been made or was probably made in Portugal and then imported to Japan. And once in Japan, the decoration had been applied on top of it. So when I say that this gun is Japanese, <laughs> I say to simplify things, but actually this gun may be materially a blend of Portuguese and Japanese make of two different geographical and cultural crafts. So let's have a look at the decoration. We can see that we can find some clouds at the two extremities towards the barrel and the stop, and in the middle we can see a dragon. And let's have a proper look at how beautifully the clouds are flowing and how the dragon is stretching out. Everything is rendered in great detail. It is really beautiful. <laughs> So, what there is to say about the decoration is to, for one second, think of the dragon. The dragon is a purely <laughs> East Oriental symbol and it is greatly used in Japanese decoration, especially of decoration of weaponry. So all we need to do is look at some swords to realize how, how much this symbol is connected to the samurai. We can look at some general sword fitting, some sword guards, some uh, sword handle decoration, and we can tell that dragons are everywhere. Not only that, but they, are, they were even engraved on the blade themselves. So we can say that finding this dragon decoration on the gun actually speaks volumes of how much in common this gun has to a local Japanese tradition of decoration of weaponry as well as adding of course so much in to share with Japanese with the Portuguese muskets with this new weapon that had come in its basic form from a country on the other side of the planet. So on the gun we can find the the decoration with the dragon and the clouds. We can also see a flower, a lotus motif, and then we can find several inscriptions. Now here I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna <laughs> look at them, but I'll tell you about them because there is a lot to remember. I'm gonna translate all the characters first and then tell you the story of the gun throughout the meaning of these characters. So the first character that we find is one for Chosen, which means Korea. After that, we find the characters for Horio Taito, which is just another name for the gun's owner, Horio Yoshiharu. We find an inscription which names Kampaku Taiko, and this is very interesting. This was the official uh, name for Toyotomi Hideyoshi when he became a retired imperial regent. So it was his official title, and it indicates personally him. And then again we find another 
name of Hario Unin Joshu. And this is a combination of words which once again indicates the owner of the gun, Horio Yoshiharu, by naming all, he, all the lands that he owned. So now that we've <laughs> looked at all these different inscriptions and engravings, let's talk about them and tell the story of the owner of the gun and of the gun itself. So, looking at the engravings, we found the name of Horio Yoshiharu. Horio Yoshiharu, we mentioned it earlier, was the owner of this gun. But who was he? He was one of the best warriors who served alongside of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Told you earlier on to remember his name. And he started serving alongside him after 1573. Uh, he came from basically nothing and he became the first lord of the clan of Matsue. We found also on the gun the name again of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Now what this means is that the gun was a present from Toyotomi Hideyoshi himself to Horio Yoshiharu. So we find also the characters for Korea. Now that is probably because between 1592 and 1598 Toyotomi Hideyoshi tried twice to invade Korea. And it's still a little bit of an enigma though because we don't know if Toyotomi Hideyoshi took this uh, gun as a reliquy from the Korean campaign and then gave it as a present to Horio Yoshiharu or if it was simply a present for one of his best warriors. We don't know exactly which was the context of finding these characters for Korea on the gun, unfortunately. <laughs> and, but still, we can tell that this gun was a very valuable object, a very unique in its looks and its decoration. And so it must have been a valuable gift for a, such an important warlord to give to one of his warriors. It represented this relationship between the two and the esteem that was from the bestower to the receiver of the gift. The reason that we had to tell that the gun was a gift is also found in, yet again, another inscription found on the gun. And this inscription is in Chinese archaic character and characters and it reads, may your longevity match that of the southern mountains and may your good fortune be as vast as the southern seas and if you're wondering yes i was reading that because i couldn't remember it and this is a very classical form of well wishing i think it suits specifically wishes to a warlord or someone who is engaged in so many battles but we need to mention it's also a Chinese formula of well-wishing that is still used today. So, to conclude, I would like to try to sum up why I think this gun is so amazing. <laughs> and I think it is because it can be looked at from so many different points of view. So first of all, we must not forget that this gun had a very practical use and that was that of being used in a battle. It was a gun. <laughs> but at the same time, this gun embodies within itself a political and perhaps personal relationship between two men. It was a present between two people who trusted each other and had a great esteem of one another. So I think that is actually very touching to see the personal relationship, how personal relationship can be embodied in an object. But then we also have to keep in mind that this was a new technology, that the, the, the gun itself probably came from a very far away country and it spoke of progress and future and possibilities. But again, at the same time, it was embedded with traditional taste and a traditional style and beauty with its beautiful dragon decoration and cloud motif and so I think we can look at it 
as a blend of artistic and material culture of two separate worlds which until a few years ago did not know of each other, which now are coming into one in one object. So I hope you also enjoyed looking at this gun as much as I did and I hope you enjoyed the video and as usual I would really appreciate it, I would love it to read your comments or your thoughts, anything that's going through your head about this gun or any anything that's going through your head, feel free to write a comment either on YouTube, here on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, whatever. <laughs> and I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye!